it comes back to that original point of why. Why do you want this? Yeah, this is why I have an application process for my coaching now. I don't just take anybody on. But when I have someone apply to come on board, I don't think about anything physical at that moment in time. All I want to know is, are you fully in? And I have like a series of questions that comes back down to three points, basically. First of all is, why do you want this? The second part is looking at barriers that's going to stop you getting there. And then the third part is, are you still in? Considering both of those things, are you still in? Because I am fully, fully in and I'm ruthless in the pursuit of excellence. Whatever the aim is, the crazier the better for me. I'm fully, fully in as a coach, so you have to be as well. And it comes back to that original point of your why. And if that's strong enough, you'll keep going. Whether you're in traffic jam, whether you, you slip over the final hurt, whatever it is, you'll just keep going. I have failed so many times for so many reasons, with so many shit excuses, but you fail forward, don't you? Keep moving forward. If that why is still there and you want something so much, you will keep going. At all costs, you find a way to win. Mike, how are you doing? Good morning, mate. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We uh, we have a lot to talk about today, so we best get straight to it. What was it about your upbringing that drew you to the military? Because it was very varied, wasn't it? Nine nine years you spent travelling about the place, and then you settled in St Helens of all places. Um, yeah. So the I, I first and foremost, I didn't join the military for Queen and Country. Um, that's this just didn't happen that way. It wasn't. I didn't go there because I watched the videos online and, and seeing all the terrorist attack around the world I didn't join up for that, that um, I joined up basically to put food on the table for my little sister uh, we travelled all around the world as, as you just said we, my dad was a soldier and we, um, we he'd left around about when I was about 9 or 10 uh, we moved basically to the cheapest place we could go and we just bounced from house to house wherever the council would give us in St. Helens um, and that's how I ended up back up north and yeah, I joined the army as early as I possibly could because it was the quickest way to put food to get money in and put food on the table. It's it's a very noble but also a very northwest attitude I find as well because I spent time in Liverpool as we've just spoken off camera and there's a very much looking after the person next to you, family first, real almost working class. Uh, let's look after ourselves rather than rely on anyone else that comes from that. Do you think you're your original upbringing in the Northwest and, and actually settling in St. Helens, has, has that played a huge part in your attitude to looking after your sister and how you ultimately look after your family now? Yeah, it's, um, you know, the way I look after my family now, I've got a little girl, is, you know, they just don't don't be like my dad. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree with you. It's a, very, it's, it's a, it is, it's a very Northwestern thing. It was, um, it was, it was. It wasn't a tough that, but that tough for me. You know, what I mean, I I got out very early, so I was only in 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 a shit environment for for a few years. My little sister had the tough time, um, so I was always looking at her, almost like a father figure straight away from a very early age. So it wasn't. It wasn't a case that I had this noble attitude. It was just I had to do what I needed to do, and that was go out and get money as quick as possible, and that was the military. So necessity drew you there. One thing I just want to touch on before before we actually go down the military career is football was a huge part of your life, wasn't it, for, for most yeah. of your upbringing. And then, I don't know what, exactly what age you were, but basically when you settled in St. Helens, rugby league is the dominant sport. Yes. And you had what was your North Star, your day-to-day -day passion, your day-to-day -day drive kind of ripped away from you. Yeah. So as a young, ambitious bloke, how did you actually, if you remember, how did you actually process having football taken away from you like that? Because I'm assuming rugby league didn't fill the gap because I've never heard you speak about your uh, your ambition for rugby league. No, it's, um, yeah, as, as you rightly say, I got that snatched away from me the moment I moved to St. Helens. Um, no, no one plays football, no one. So uh, that was my, the only thing I knew was playing football. I played at a very decent standard at that age and then all of a sudden just got that swept from under my feet and didn't play again. Um, but funnily enough, coming full circle, a lot of my research and whenever I've written programmes now for the military, has a lot of the research I've done has been based on rugby league, which, which we can come on to later because it's a very stop-start by nature, very aggressive, and it, there's not that much research in the tactical athlete space. So utilising rugby league was really, really good for me. So and having a little bit of an understanding, so it worked. It worked its way. One way was, but. Um, yeah, I had no intention of playing. I did play because I had to play and played in school. Um, I've got like I've won like national trophies and stuff with school, but I had no intention of um, of ever playing rugby. Um, I was just quick, so they just put me on the wing. And 
Yeah. So that, and when we got to a certain age and people started realising that all they had was speed and no 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 skin in the game. <laughs> Physic, physics just, catches up, doesn't it? <laughs> quickly, yeah. And I just there's a lad now who plays for Saints, um, and I can remember it vividly, like year nine or ten, and he absolutely hit me like a train. And it, he looks now the, the size he is now playing on the telly. But he was that size when he was, you know, thirteen, fourteen, and he hit me like a freight train. And I thought, this game's shit. <laughs> it's what funny because I, I, uh, I, puberty hit me like a train, as, as he did you at a young age. And I was a, a very heavy, very large rugby player up until the age of about fifteen, sixteen, when everybody else caught up. And then I realised, oh, you're not actually that good at this game. <laughs> you, you're just bigger than everyone else now. Everyone else has caught up, so uh, the, the tables were were very much turned on me, and equilibrium was found, shall we say? But. It's fascinating that you had that snatched away from you, and then you had that that ambition, that drive, that that part of you that you needed to fill that wasn't being satisfied by rugby league. So I can imagine the military became a bit of an outlet for that, with that that drive, that discipline, that structure, that let's let's progress in every way that we can, as you were doing with football. But you joined at sixteen, didn't you? And that was that was as you said, out of necessity. It wasn't because you thought, right, I want, I want to serve as soon as I can. It was a case of the, the quicker I can get money in, the better. Do you want to just talk us through your thought process and actually the reality of the application process of what it was like getting into uh, the military at 16? So I was, um, I actually joined on my 17th birthday because I was meant to start the Army Foundation College at 16. Went and passed, um, originally went and uh, got hold of my dad and said, what, what do I need to join? I have no idea what I'm doing here. I just need to get money on the table quick. Um, so I said, right, I'm joining the Army. He joined the Army at the same age, so it was, it was like this, whatever, sad. He said, you either join the Paris or the Marines. And I was like, okay, which one? He went and joined the Paris. Um, Googled it as well, seen it could get an extra £200 a day. So I was like, right, parachute regiment. So I went down to um, the selection process to go and get into the Paris, went and passed that. Didn't have any idea at this stage that these were a little bit of a different breed to everyone else. I just presumed this was the army. I was, yeah, went and passed that, came back. Um, obviously, it was naturally, naturally quite quite fit so very lucky and I um, yeah so then what I found I was meant to start the Army Foundation College in the September but I was still 16 so what this so what I then found out that if I waited till I was 17 the Army Foundation College is one year worth of phase one training followed by six months worth of phase two training uh, six months a few months of phase two training or I could go the adult entry and just do six months basic training and I was like and remember, at the end of that, I'm getting an extra two hundred pound a month. My whole reasoning is to earn money, so I was like, "Well, I'll just do that. I wait, I wait a month, and then join as an adult." Again, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So, seventeenth birthday, I make my way up to Catrick, and wow, <laughs> that is um, just straight, straight in at the deep end. It was just you know, I was a gobshite seventeen-year-old, thought the world owed me everything. I grew up in a little shitty place um, where I was fighting every day and doing whatever I could to earn money, um, you know. And I was just, and I was in in with men. It was men, and I was a boy, you know. I, I, I joke about it all the time, and people saying I was doing double science on the Friday in Parrage Depot on the Monday. Just it just hit me hard. It was just like, but again, I was so naive to the situation. I just presumed this was the army. This is this is what it is, and. And my why was very, very strong in the fact that you're going to give me £800 every single month. All I've got to do is hold on. Easy. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not, never going to ring the bell. £800 a month. Yeah, I'll take that. That was huge money for me. Um, and that was just getting sent straight home. So I never went home on the weekends. Never had any time away. And all the whole way through training, I stayed at Catrick for six months. Every bit of money went back to my mum. And I just survived. I just held on for dear life. Um, struggled every single day was way off the mark, was nowhere near the top. But somehow I was one of the nine originals that made it out of sixty odd that started and you know, I was the youngest by a long way and we I survived. Um and that was that was what it was and it was only when I when I got out the other end that I realised that, you know, what I achieved there was, was quite significant. Um and it is and only now I've been back as an instructor you realise just how significant that is and how hard it is. Um so yeah, I just it was it was a case of my why was so strong that the money had to go home. I wasn't leaving ever. They they do things to us where they'd be like, two of you are leaving today. 
we'll keep going till two of you leave. Any two, don't care. And I'd just be in in the corridor doing whatever they had, had us doing, just thinking, well, someone just ring the bell because I'm not leaving. Someone, please, just someone, someone just go and do it because I'm not going anywhere. So the sooner you, the sooner you realise that you don't want it, the better. I think this is a, this is a big thing because it's it's quite in vogue at the moment to to take on big scary challenges it's something that's spoken about in this medium podcasting quite a lot it's something that's very popular because people have realized post pandemic that bigger harder things are going to make you better stronger more developed as an individual and your why gave you that knowledge without any any academia any lessons learned it was just purely driving you forwards because your why was strong enough and i think that's the that's the real thing that's important for people to realize these days is that doing what another person does because you've seen them do it and you think that oh, i want to give that a go because that looks hard or that looks challenging that might give me something ultimately if your why isn't strong enough it's not going to get you through it it's why i think people need to assess where they are in their lives and really reflect on what will give them benefit and and drive them forwards and where they can learn lessons and i mean my why from ultra endurance now has become self-discovery i know there is a better version of myself on the other side of all this and that's something that i keep as my sort of north star so it's great to hear for you that that just came to you naturally because your why was that strong so with that in mind what surprised you most i mean it sounded like naivety was your biggest strength in many ways but what actually surprised you most about most about the course yeah what was it that surprised you most about the process was there anything that you was particularly good at anything you were particularly poor at anything that you really had a tough is there a specific day that you remember thinking oh this is this is not what i was thinking to, to be brutally honest i was pretty shit at most things depot isn't about becoming a pirate it, it is because you're a parachute at the end of it it's about surviving it's a rite of passage at the end of that train and you go right you nine are strong enough in the mind and in the body to now go and become a paratrooper. That's the way I see it. So I, I, I was I was just getting over the quality line every single time. I was so, the the standard was was of me was probably really, really poor. I mean, it's, it wasn't, I'm, I'm, obviously I made it, I, I was hitting the quality line, which is, and it's a quite high quality line to try and hit. But I was crawling over the line. Um, the big thing that surprised me most was watching grown men break, physically break, mentally break down. They just could not do it. And they had a lot of life experience, so they understood fully what they was going into. Whereas I was very naive and had no idea what was happening. And seeing grown men break down, twice your age, fully break down and just like, I can't do this anymore. My body won't let me do it. And I'm just like, it does. <laughs> just keep going. You know, it's, it's... And only now, what I know now is obviously it's changed a lot of my thinking. I was there just surviving and I couldn't sustain that. There was no sustainability in that, you know. At some point, I was going to break, um, as everyone everyone has a break. Everyone has a breaking strain, but it's um, yeah. It was just that that was the biggest surprise for me, and I'd, I'd never seen it before because I'd never really been around adults. You know, I'd only ever been around people my age. I've, I've not got much family, so it was only ever people my age that I'd seen. Then all of a sudden, I'm in these groups. I'm in sections of grown men, and I'm I'm literally just a boy. I was, I look at pictures now and I'm thinking. You know, I was literally, you look at someone now in school and then that's me with these grown men doing exactly the same things with the same weight at the same times, carrying the same stretches, the same logs up at the same time. I, mean, I had no hair on my face, none, not a single hair on my face. And it used to get me because one of the ways, um, they used to make me shave. They used to stand behind me and watch me scraping my skin. And not, there was nothing on that, but they knew it was, and now my neck's like fucked because of it, but... <laughs> And it's like, uh, that was one of the things I hated so much, but I was just like, there's no, I'm not going anywhere. So it was, but that was the biggest surprise for me, just watching grown men crumble. Uh, what, what's fascinating there is that their life experience, whilst on, on one side, you could probably view it as something that's going to better equip them for this. Maybe it gave them knowledge that actually the comfort that lies in ringing the bell the fact that maybe there's more to life that I can explore than this was actually a limiting factor for them. And it meant that their emotions, it was harder for them to bring their emotions back down to neutrality rather than letting them go haywire. Because I mean, I can imagine there are hundreds of situations where you you felt that surge in emotion, you felt that surge in anger, you felt that surge in fear, and you managed to bring it back down to neutrality where you could just look at things objectively and move forwards because your why was strong enough. Whereas the more life experience and the more you've got 
outside of that moment, the more difficult it, the more difficult it's going to be to not let that that initial surge in emotion spiral out of control. So I think some of the, that, that, what you said there is just it's, it's a way that we can look at things in our own lives because if you can try and learn to reframe your emotions and how you react to things when the going gets tough, when there's that surge in emotions, when you get an email that really pisses you off or whatever it might be, we can we can put it in, in, in any lens. The more you can bring that back to, right, what is it that I'm looking at here and how do I move forwards, the more effective you can be as a soldier, as a leader, as an employee, as a father, whatever it might be. And I think, uh, yeah, you learned that lesson very, very young, which must have carried you forwards in many, many ways. Yeah, it's, it's, it's taught me a lot that I, you know, when I went and did my degree in coaching, a lot of it was psychology based in, in, in learning all about reflection. And I, re- I vividly remember, excuse me, every single night thinking I'm still here. I'm still here. Like, how? I'm, like, still, I'm still here. It's another day down. One more day down. Like, tomorrow's another day. We go again. Was there any sense of pride? Were you feeling proud as you did it, or was it just it is what it is? Another no, day? not in, not in the moment. In the moment, there was it, so reflection in action. There wasn't there wasn't any sort of and even on action, there wasn't any sort of pride that I never felt good about anything. Uh, the one thing I did is when I went and passed P Company. So P Company is the physical test that everyone um, knows and refers the paras back to. It's uh, one week of tested arduous events. Nothing we hadn't done before, but for everyone attached to the parachute regiment, P Company is the be all and end all it's the biggest thing for them so they, they if you want to be attached to the powers you've got to go and do P Company and people see it as like the pinnacle and being brutally honest P Company in depot is the easiest week for the powers it's our easiest week because all you've got to do is this is fitness but we haven't got everything external to it um, so when I passed that I thought right and you basically get you've got a green backing on behind your cap badge so you wear your berry You've got the parachute regiment cap badge, but you wear a big, massive green backings and make sure that you know you are not in yet. You've not made it yet. And you earn everything. So you're earning stuff at every step of the way. And so when you pass P coming, you get to take your green backing off. And that was that was the moment I thought, wow, I've 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 passed P company. Like, my God, I'm 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 gonna do it. I'm gonna pass this. I've got I've got you no know, two months left of training. That's the, the shit part. You think you're done, you, you and then all of a sudden, they make you you go, you go you deploy straight on something called the mole. It's called the mole, and all you do is go and dig for five days straight, no sleep, it's complete sleep debt, sleep deprivation, and all you've got to do is dig, and it just breaks people. You think you they put you on this big high, you pass peak coming, it's amazing, you're physically amazing, and then they go right now let's see how good your psychology is. And I just remember being, I remember, remember being on such a high that one moment I had this huge, massive amount of pride, and then all of a sudden I'm two days in, digging, thinking, "Where's my life gone? Why am I here? What I'm just a I weak doing? little mole." <laughs> and then exactly, and then you can see again grown men who've just worked so hard for twenty weeks got this, got to this moment, going, "What? Like, do you know what? Sack this. Get me out of this hole. I'm done." It goes back to that emotional emotional control thing, though, doesn't it? Because whether you're a soldier or whether you're just a human working your way through life, it's it's the exact same thing, just magnified. It's it's yeah. how do you deal with the ebbs and flows of life? What do you let beat you? What do you take control of? And they do the same thing in SF, don't they? The amount of time, the amount of stories I've heard about people getting through the final day of hills. Oh, lads, you want a cup of tea? You want a bacon roll? There's a bacon roll and land over at the end of it, and and then there's nothing there, and then they, you get there, and they tell you to turn around and go back the other way, and the people yeah. are like, nah, done, done, it's over, because they were expect in their head they were thinking right, positive emotions, there's there's that reinforcement, there's something that I'm looking forward to, there's something that's going to make me feel warm, make me feel comfortable, and then when it's not there, and then when you get the exact flip side and have to go the other way, you just fold. So it's a case yeah. of how 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 can we the the question I think I want listeners to take away is how can we as individuals find ways to better train that mechanism in our day-to-day lives so that when we get some bad news, when we have a really bad day at work, when we're stuck in traffic and meet the biggest meeting that we were going to have all that week, how do we keep our emotions under control so that we can look at things for what they are rather than what our brain is catastrophizing them that they could be? And then how do you keep moving forward? How do you keep digging when you sleep deprived is kind of the, the way that I'm framing this now. It comes back to that original point of why why do you want this why do you want to be here this is why I have an application process for my coaching now I don't just take anybody on but when I have someone apply to 
come on board and be an athlete um, I don't think about anything physical at that moment in time all I want to know is are you fully in and I have like a series of questions that comes back down to three points basically first of all is why do you want this so much tell me in your own words why do you want it the second part is looking at barriers that's going to stop you getting there and then the third part is are you still in considering both of those things are you still in because I am fully fully in and I'm ruthless in the pursuit of excellence when it comes to even with a coach athlete relationship whatever it is whatever the aim is the crazier the better for me is I'm fully fully in as a coach so you have to be as well and it comes back to that original point of your why and if that's strong enough you mentioned it before about that North Star if that is strong enough you'll keep going whether you're in traffic jam whether you, you slip over the final hurt whatever it is you'll just keep going I have failed so many times for so many reasons with so many shit excuses but you fail forward don't you keep moving forward if that why is still there and you want something so much you will keep going at all costs you find a way to win this reflects in in business in in, in where it's ultimately if you're if you're an employee and you you have it's it's where the metrics that you create for yourself become important because ultimately if you're in a let's say you're in a sales role and you've obviously got these black and white metrics that you've got to hit every month those are somebody else's metrics those aren't the things that are intrinsically your why yeah. and a sales job is just one example of many where you're working within somebody else's game and yes you've got to do your best yes you've got to, you've got to play that game whether it's in business as well there's certain financial metrics that you've got to hit to be able to stay alive you got to, you got to do all these things but the intrinsic internal motivations that keep you moving forwards to justify why those metrics exist in the first place, I think is the layer below that a lot of people often lose sight of. And I think it's it's when when you get lost in the metrics and the black and white nature of things, that's when you can start to really let your emotions get the better of you because it's so easy to label yourself, I fell short here. Well, you can look at the reality of the situation. Why did you fall short? What could you have done better? How can you reframe things? Were there reasons why that happened? Were there societal things going on? How can you look at that? And ultimately, what did you as an individual get out of it as part of the process? I think that's why everybody that I've met in the military comes out the other side with such a refined set of skills because over and over and over they've been forced to ask that question of why am I here? Why am I doing this? And as you've mentioned, you've carried it into your career at this point. But why don't we rewind a little bit just so people have a bit more context on, on how you've got to this position. So passed out P Company and managed to get the little green back in off, off your beret. Must have been a good moment. Well, before you became a... I'm all. A critter for five days. <laughs> Brutal. And what what was the rest of your career like from there? It was very varied. And I know that there was an, a, a bit of an initial pain in the fact, well, not pain, but initially you, you had to look after the funerals, for example, which is which is a very unconventional direction to have to go in, I can imagine. Yeah. And that with it comes a very emotionally demanding requirement. So why don't you just run us through your military career from, from passing out to ultimately when you left about, was it a year ago? Yeah, just, so yeah. the... Um, yeah, so that, that initial that initial part of my career is probably the toughest out of everything I've ever done out of parachute regiment depot, any of the other courses, any you know whatever it was, Afghan, any anything. The toughest part of my whole career has always been that first six months. So obviously, when I passed out, what I didn't, and so in my grand big great thinking that I had joining the army, I'm going to get the quickest, I'm going to get the money, I'm going to join the paras and get an extra two hundred pound, do all this. What my thinking didn't consider was the fact that I could, was not allowed to deploy until I was 18. And because I was so young, I was only 17 when I passed when I passed out. Everyone else was, it was in on the 08 tour where everyone deployed. And obviously because I wasn't old enough, I had to stay back. So one of my jobs I went straight into was repatriations and funerals. And my job was basically traveling around the country and being part of a team that did repats and funerals and it was just brutal, it was horrible um, and that was my first look at life in the military and it was f fucking awful, um, hated every second of it, but what that did is um, that built a layer up um, things aren't that bad every every step of the way from there on out, nothing's that bad you know, everything's, everything's happy now, you know, you can be as low as you possibly think and you're never going to be that low that's, that was a horrible time in my life and things will never be that bad. So from there, what it did is it fueled the fire of I wanted to just be a soldier so much at this point now. All I wanted, I was like so keen 
Like all I wanted to do was be the best possible soldier I could be. And what I realised is that very early on is that these boys are going to come back with six months worth of tactical, technical and physical proficiency of their job. They're going to be really good. It's like almost like missing half the season in football or rugby and trying to get back on the train. So I was like on the sly learning as much as I can. I was training really hard. So when the moment they got back and touched down, I could get on the treadmill with them and I was straight in with them. And I thought they're going to be on me as well. They're going to be you know, getting straight on me because I was the one who didn't go. But do you know, it was the absolute opposite because of the job I had to do. They actually, they flew me out to like, I did, um, I flew me out to like Cyprus to go and meet the boys when they was there and I was doing jobs out there and stuff. So they looked after me really because I think they real, the, the, the head shed realised that, you know, they're putting a quite a bit of, bit of strain on, on, a, on a kid basically. So um, so actually I was I was all right. When they got back, I was, I was and I was good at my job. So I was, um, I blended in really, really well. And then I was then gonna I was deploying back to Afghan anyway a year later when I was gonna be old enough a year and a half later so it was it was all good and I had a year and a half worth of training went and deployed to Afghan um, and yeah c- come back from there but seven month tour there come back and subsequently moved to I, I got real I felt really ill actually um, after Afghan uh, I was uh, bleeding from all the wrong places in my body where I shouldn't have been. Uh, I found it, uh, I started pissing blood one day after a really, really simple, easy run. It was just out on a run, really simple, low level, zone two, everyone's chatting, conversational pace, everyone um, come back in, was having, still talking, having a piss, didn't feel anything. And then as I'm pissing, I'm talking to my mate next to me and he just said, he just like went all white and, was, and he was just like, Chad, Chad, look, look down, I was just complete blood. And I was like, what the fuck? And from then things went really south really quickly was having blood taken from me um, every couple of days was in and out of Selly Oak in Birmingham Hospital um, blood was coming out of everywhere and they just couldn't find the problem and I walked into a room one day and he sat me down and said alright you've got there's, there's three possible outcomes here best case scenario is you've um, got kidney stones um, or, and they mentioned something else that goes along with it or you've got um, bowel cancer or a tumour in your bladder and then just went silent. I was just sat there like, what? What's going on here? I was just like, what is happening? Like, is, are they my only three options? Is that all you're going to give me? The, uh, no- the, the, give the me delivery, delivery needed a bit more empathy by yeah. the sounds of things. <laughs> What's number four? Give me the fourth option. He was, he was just, and he was just like, yeah, that was it. And I went out the room and I was just like, I'm going to continue to check you. Um, but at the same time, I en- then ended up getting a post. I had to move over to um, Special Forces Support Group whilst I was going through all this and in the end I had a couple of operations to remove um, what they did is they, they was doing this one check and it was check all every I was getting checked constantly for all sorts of stuff in and out of every sort of scanning thing you can think of and they said they found two inguinal ingrowing hernias and what they was what they thought they was doing is they was growing that big and going that fast they was pushing on organs inside my body that was making thing basically upsetting the internal mechanisms inside my body and they went right we need to remove these now and I was just like right let's do it so literally within within 24 36 hours I was on it I was getting operated on but where they was they had to cut my hip flexor open um, so they had to they couldn't go in they couldn't do it keel they had to a huge slice loads and loads of stitches but that put me out for e. That was even worse. Then, so uh, my fitness was going down the drain anyway because I was having that many checks and that much blood taking up my body. I was just, I was losing weight. I was in shit state. And the moment I had my hip flexor cut open, then that was like fucking game over. Then, um, so I spent a lot of time on the sidelines, a lot of time like ill and injured. And so from that, so in one part, and then what I went uh, ended up saying, right, send me back to two para because I need to be in around my mates. So wh- when you're in um, SFSG, the you're on rotation. So if you miss your rotation, you don't see anybody. It's like a ghost town. So what I um, I was now out of the loop because I just had this operation, and so I said, right, if I'm gonna if I've got three months of reco- whatever it was recovery, send me back with two para so I can at least be around people for my psychosocial part of life. And so they sent me back. Fortunately enough, so the guy who the guy who was in charge of that decision, I'd just been on tour with him, so I, I was close, so I could walk into his office and he squared me away. And so I went back to Tupara, um, 
and then went straight onto this commander course. And the first thing I had to do was this physical test that should have been really easy. It was that it's that easy with the parries. We don't even do it. It's it's that like low level, and I was in shit state on it. I was in such a bad way, and I thought and that at that moment I come back in, passed it, but it was it was a case of you should be I should be breezing over the line here. Should not be. It shouldn't be any anything strenuous. And I've always been in the mindset that the loaded march test it was the loaded march they have to do so where you travel from A to B carrying kit for those who don't know is um, tactical advance to battle it's known as your job doesn't start until you get to the finish line so where people are like crawling over the line that's not okay because you've now got a job to do um, and there was no way I was doing a job at the end of this test and I thought right I will never ever feel that way again the moment I got back into it I thought I'll never feel like that again and that just like that's what fueled the fire for fitness then. But what happened after that course is because I'd just come back from one par, I never had a report. It's a big no-no in the military. So officers, one of their job is report writing. I never had a report, so I got pulled into an office. I was meant to promote off the back of it. I'd done enough to, to pass. and get, um, to Got a big enough, a bit, a good enough grade to pass. Got told I couldn't promote at that moment because I didn't have a report. So he said, we're so sorry. What do you want? Now, getting a PTI course in the Paras is like rocking horse shit. It's so hard because everyone's fit. To be the fittest of the fittest is very difficult. There's only a few spots to go, and I was like, PTI course. And he was like, done. I was just like, okay. Because what I wanted to know was, I, I fueled the fire of that with that test that I just struggled on. I thought, I don't want to feel like that again. I want to understand what's just happened to my body from a rehabilitation point of view, and I want to understand how I get better. PTI course, easy. Literally got told that on a Friday. Monday started the PTI course, and it just that's where my life just took over. Then it was all I wanted. Um, just fell in love with fitness. It, um, it's fascinating that the, uh, the 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 immediate action has set you up for the rest of your life. And I, I think a, a lesson there, and I actually reflect on the way that I do things, is whenever I get a real fire up my ass for something, I'm straight into action on it, and it's mm -hmm. it's chipping away at something because I know that if I feel that fire, then the best thing that I, you, we in general can do is just get straight on it because you can then build momentum. You can sort of, it's compound interest effect. It's the compound interest effect applies to everything in life. But if you can just get straight on it, then the the gains, the growth, the self-development that will come from doing that in that moment of emotion, in that moment of drive, in that moment of passion will move you, move you forwards much more effectively than if you waited a couple of weeks. If you thought, oh, that, that sounds exciting, I'll get to it because you are, how many, how many years ago is that now? That PTI course was done in 2013, so... Uh, nine, nine years later, and you're still yeah. living, breathing, and, and stoking that fire that you felt from ultimately what was one tough day at the office yeah. from a rehab whole, point of view. Well, every, every, every situation... So I, I, I talk about this in my book, is that every, every crazy decision, everything I've ever done has been done through no fault of my own, but it's, it's all been by mistake. At every moment, there's been a shit situation where I've turned it really positive. I've put it into an opportunity. So, you know, when I finished the PTI course, I come back, I still had, I, I, I loved fitness even more and I was taking fitness and loved it, but I still had no intention of going being a coach. No intention of doing it being a P PTI. It was just great. I've got that. I understand it. Now I'm getting fitter. I'm getting everyone else fitter. Perfect. I still want, I wanted to go on special forces selection. Still wanted to be a soldier more than anything. When I'm past the, um, the aptitude course and Passed out. Was meant to go on, on selection in, in the summer, and I got pulled off selection by a commander to basically go be like a low level commander. I've been promoted by this point to go, to go and be a low level commander in the in the jungle. And I was like, it was a train exercise though. And I was like, no, this is my career. I need to go on that. And anyway, I kicked off that hard. Again, a shit situation. They set me up to Catrick to go and be one of the six PTIs that are in control of the parachute regiment PT syllabus up there. And that was the moment that I went up there, walked through the gates, I was like, right, I'm not sitting still, very still in my mind, I want to be the best soldier I can be. Got told I wasn't allowed to go on selection for a year at least, because there was no one to take my, I was now in, I was now in charge of people. There was no one to, to take over me, no one to look after my people. So um, I thought, right, I'm not sitting still. Uh, and was just <laughs> literally just on my laptop, playing, whilst football manager was loading up, was looking at how I can better um, how I could get something out of this two years and I thought looking going on and before I knew it I'd signed up for this degree 
at a uni, full time. Told ne- told the uni didn't have a job. I was literally affiliated with a uni. Never told the military I was now in uni, and I was just like, "Fuck, I've signed up to uni. Here. I'm in three years." And I was just like, "Fuck it, see what happens. Make yeah. it up as you go along. Hope for the best." <laughs> yeah, so I binned every external influence you can think of. Football manager got binned, um, and television got binned. No Xbox, no PlayStation. My room in camp was, and I wasn't going home ever at this point. Was all day. I would be taking PT all day it was my sole job and in night all night go into my room and all there was was a bed and a desk with a laptop on it books stacked as high as you can possibly think and all I would do is study all night and then implement theory into practice the following day to between 100 and 200 people for two years straight the level I went up was every day I was just going I was just getting better and better and I, was, and I fell in love with it and I was like I love this shit and I loved knowing every. I wanted to know more. The more I was reading, the more I was understanding, I wanted to know more. Then I got selected to go and be um, for the Royal Army Physical Training Corps. And and yeah, and it was, uh, again, another, another, another shit situation that happened. So my mum, but coming full circle of why I was, why I was in there in the first place to keep all the money on the table, my mum went even worse, was, was really ill. Um, she subsequently died a couple of years ago but at this point she was at her lowest where I had to go back and take out full control over my sister for months whilst my mum was um, in an in a induced coma and again fitness had to take a side step because I still had my degree to do so what I was doing is basically sat next to my mum all day every day little sister would go to school and I'd just be studying um, and then at the back of that I completely forgot that I was meant to go and try out for PT course selection and I was like, right, fitness has gone down the drain, not a problem. And I wasn't training at all, um, odd run, but my focus was, I was trying to be like, trying to control a family and maintain uni. So um, priorities took over. And yeah, went on the selection, again, done awfully, but what am I, obviously past the standards, but my theory was that high. I, I felt like invincible. There was nothing they could do with me because I knew everything. Whatever they could throw at me, I'd, although I hadn't prepped, I could back it, everything I set up. With science, I understood the body, so therefore I understood how to manipulate the body. And I thought, if they don't want that, if they don't like that, then I'm going the wrong place anyway. Past that, and then, um, and that's how, and that's how, and then, so I, and then I had to do my final year of uni whilst I was on my class one course, which is also nine months, at exact, starting at exactly the same time, where you also do another degree, and you do more diplomas, and you do every course under the sun of like, every instructional qualification you can think of from um, fucking kayaking to rock climbing to mountain biking to boxing officiating to athletics officiating uh, boxing judge timekeeper a diploma in leadership so there's so much theory to do and I was trying to, to also manage my I'd moved down south so I was five six hours away trying to manage my home life I just got married I just built this and I was like that year was so tough again you know but I learned so much from that final year I, I, that was a more about managing and timekeeping and processes which has set me up really well for business um, and that's how I ended up being and then I got you know I got sent over to all around the country and just upskilling and delivering programs and writing and re- reinventing the wheel basically to, and um, that's how it started and that's how I just fell in love with coaching and um, that's all I wanted to do was make people better. So did your why change as time went on then? Because obviously when you started, it was purely financially driven. It was purely a way, it was a means to an end to look after your sister, to look after your mum. Yeah. The deeper and deeper you got into the military, the deeper and deeper you got into this, this thirst for knowledge. Did your why change? Did you ever lose sight of the original why? Were there moments where you thought, yeah. oh, forget about the books for a second. You've got your sister to look to look after or or were there moments where you had to check yourself in that sense or did you just acknowledge that you developed as a person you'd found another reason to be doing what you were doing and that gave you even more passion to keep moving forwards yeah so I was falling into all these things but every time I fell into it I thought I want to be the best in this space so the moment I went up to Catrick I wanted to be the best PTI you know I've, I've all I've and it started and I was getting I thought I'm actually pretty good at this and I thought right Am I really the best soldier? Probably not. I was good, but I'm 
I think I'm the best at this. So let's stick, let's run at this wholeheartedly. And now I'd like to think that that's done well because if I would have passed UKSF selection, you know, I would never have been here. I'd never been talking about anything like that. And there would have been one person in it. Where now I'd like to think I've helped so many more people and more get to that stage. So there's more bums on the seats in that unit. Um, so that's how, that's how I feel about it now. But the why was changing all the time. But I mean, it did, but it's, the why was always about winning, always about just bettering myself. Because I knew that my, my sister was getting taken care of, you know, it's, that's I was doing that. That's I'd, I'd learned, so I had more, a lot more life experience now, I could manage stuff. Um, so that was fine, that was that was, that was was happening. I just kept running at coach. All I wanted to do was be better. I wanted to understand the body more and more and more. When did you decide to exit? And when did you become confident in what you're doing now was the solution and the direction you were gonna go in your life? So one of my jobs was to travel around the country and upskill everyone else from PT core to PTI. So everyone everyone was, we sat in a, one of the groups known as the Brains. There was like six of us travel around the country. And we was basically in charge of like annual deficit training, all that type of stuff. And the more and more I knew and learned, and I was getting, you know, I was getting all these lovely commendations and awards. It was on the Queen's Birthdays Honours list in 2019, and it was getting better and better. But I'd reached a ceiling in the PT core whereby, because I was, so, I got told I was too young to go to keep get promoted at this at this rate, so you're gonna have to sit still. And obviously, I was in this mindset that I'm not okay with that. I need to keep going. I need to, I need more. I'm, I'm give me more. I want. I just want to get better and better and better. And had the concept of tactical athlete and I wanted to treat every soldier like an athlete so I wanted to change their mindset from just doing it as a as a vocation as a job and it was now I want you to basically do it as an I want you to live and breathe like an athlete because it's not a, and the reason I do that with as I call them tactical athletes is the fact that they are athletes but in our world if we lose if we're not that good it's not a loss of points or pride that we lose we lose a life or a limb or a friend so the stakes are extremely high so let's train accordingly for that and that was the mindset but what I started doing then was branching out and it wasn't just the army I was looking at I was then working started doing online stuff started the social media stuff doing online I was like helping people and one of the and I started looking at I started helping New York firefighters and then I was helping these guys over in um, New Zealand SF and Australian specialist police and I had South African anti-poachers and my horizon was broadening and I thought well, I can't keep can't control it so obviously if I stay in the army I've got to stick with the army and stick with just coaching them and, and I thought I want to know more I want to branch out I want to do more and I wanted to go home just had a little girl and never been home for years and I thought it was the right time to, to, to A make the jump and I thought I'm, I'm good enough to, to run at this and I want to be able to open up my coaching and coach mm, a plethora of tactical athletes not just soldiers and that's what I did and I ran at it and then that's now branched out into, sport, into the sporting world and um, with mixed martial arts and and yeah and that's that so that that was my wife for getting out and you know fueled especially when I had my little girl and I wanted to come home every night to her um, yeah that, that was why it was a really really easy decision and it was I almost had one foot out the door anyway so obviously I was away three weeks out of the four every month with the Paris all the time and then all of a sudden I was now a PTI in depot, a lot more structure. I knew what was happening throughout the week. Curveballs happened all the time, but predominantly I knew exactly what was gonna happen. We're in the Paris, we just, my kit was by the door, you know, packed, good to go. And we'd go on exercise or whatever, and it'd be like, right, you're going on exercise for three weeks on Wednesday. Begs the question as well, doesn't it? It's, it's a young man's game, isn't it, for, oh, yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. the most part? It, it sounds like a lot of what you just said is that you just grew up a little bit. You yeah, wanted more I, structure. I loved it. I loved it. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely loved it. And I didn't know anything else. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything else in the wider army. So the moment I went up to Catrick and some, so the first thing when I went to Catrick, someone said, how many leave days have you got? And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, well, well, how do you know when you're going on leave? And this is from another unit. I was like, I get told. Like, they just say, oh, go, go home. You got two weeks off now. And they'd be like, no, no, you get, you get days, you go on JPA. And I was like, what's that? And JPA is like this portal where you go and basically manage your own admin. You can go and book leave. And I was like, I can book a day off whenever I want it. It was like, 
yeah and I was like what I've been in the army at this point for like so many years and I was, never even knew this thing and I was like what is going on there? all these people knew knew the whole system it was just like yeah you can do this you can do that you can book that course you can go and go onto this website and you can get that course booked and they'll pay for that and you can go and get money from there and you write this letter and they'll give you this education I was thinking oh my god this is amazing like so I, I, I was always my foot was almost out the door at this point I was thinking oh I quite like this Okay. Okay. That's, that's fascinating. How it just goes from chaos to structure, and how actually yeah. oh, that, that, yeah. that structure started to lead you in a different direction. Because I, yeah. I mean, I, I need structure in my life to be effective. I know a lot of people do. I, th- I do believe everybody does. I, I've met some people that think that they're much more going going with the flow of day to day, and actually that's how they get the best out of themselves. But I, I personally can't comprehend how that would make sense but maybe that's just my biases coming out to uh, coming out to play but I think yeah, 100%, yeah. from from your perspective reflecting on all of the experience you've had within the army and now out mm-hmm. there will be military applicants there will be military personnel there will be operators listening to this what are the biggest mistakes that you see people making along the way in terms of their fitness but let's look at it from from two angles in terms of getting in, getting your foot in the door in the first place. Because we look after a lot of athletes all over the world that are in a tactical space as well, and there's a lot of common ones. So getting in, getting your foot in the door in the first place, and then more importantly, maintaining it as you go once once you're in. Because operational fitness is v- a lot more varied than I think traditionally it's been considered. So from your experience, having walked the walk and actually talked the talk and done every element of it within that space specifically. What are the common mistakes that you see made from applicants and then soldiers? Two, two common mistakes. They're either underprepared or overprepared. Predominantly, what you see is people join the military, so taking your first step in tactical athlete development. People predominantly are underprepared. Those taking their next step in tactical athlete development, so going on a P company, a commando course, a SF selection, whatever, whatever their, their, their relevant course is, they're overprepared. So what they do is they people going on UKSF selection pretty much do selection before they go on selection, and then they turn up and can't understand why their knees have popped, and it's just like because you you're putting that much stress through your body that now you're asking it for more stress when it matters. So um, that they're the, they're the two main things that you always see, and so whatever I ever do is um, especially those joining the military. What you got to remember is when people join in the army. They're going to go through basic training where they're going to make them into soldiers. So you don't have to turn up a soldier. So all you have to do, and this is this is how, this is how I changed the Army Foundation College. This is how I, I the the programs I put in place there was what they was trying to do was first and foremost they was trying to um, train them as an adult. Then they tried to train them as kids which there was ba- ba- nothing so it was basically all fluffy people were throwing yellow cards up to like commanders and stuff and then they was turning up to Power Edge Depot and getting hit like a freight train like that bloke did hit me in rugby and they just couldn't handle it so everyone was failing so what I then turned up and I know I, there was a lot of science involved in it I turned up I understood peak height velocity and I looked at maturational status and noticed there was a window of opportunity of testosterone levels in 16 year olds where we could make them absolute monsters but predominantly it was about it wasn't about making them paratroopers, so only a few of them want to go and join the parachute regiment. My first cohort was 20 people wanted to go, and there's like 1,800 people in camp. Um, of uh, That's not just junior soldiers mixed, but 20 people is quite a, a small amount. So I created this program called Op Achilles, and I didn't name it, by the way, I hate the name. Um, some commander probably got an MBE for that, but it's uh, a <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dreadful name. And uh, I don't even know what, what how it's relevant to the parachute regiment. I have no idea. Reinforcing but, uh, people's ankles? I don't know. Yeah, maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Um, well, we did, actually, so fair one. But uh, what we did is I, re- I realised straight away that people had tried this before, and what they've done is, you're right, you've got to, so I've got to create this programme that's external to their normal programme. And I was like, okay. So the problem is no one's passing parachute regiment training as a junior soldier. And they're all failing maybe because they're not good enough or fit enough. I said, okay. So what we're gonna do, I want, I want you to do 12, you got 12 weeks from, from the last 12 weeks of training. I want you to create a program. And I was like, okay, so I can't do it in work hours because they've got the normal program. So I was like, so it's early mornings, late nights, brilliant. Um, great for me. But more isn't always better. So just adding three extra sessions a week for 12 weeks. 
So doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a better product. So what I was like, so I had to start managing. That's when I really started delving into the science of individualization and training. Um, I created this program whereby we just not only did it do the maturational stuff we've just talked about, but I was focused. It was athlete led. I treated these kids like athletes, like they was at an academy. Um, up the scoff, so I wrote to uh, Defence Naval, I think it's called, where it's like the that's that's who determines how much calories each soldier gets. Wrote to them, said we're doing this, we're doing that, and managed to get it ticked off that now everyone on this up Achilles pathway would get a fourth meal in the night. That was twofold. Not only did I want extra calories because I was training them more, and we wanted to do hypertrophy, build the muscles. I'll come on to why, but I wanted to sit them all down together. So in Harrogate of eighteen hundred people, these twenty people spread out across everyone so the first time they would see each other was Powerheads Depot normally now that wasn't okay so what I thought is strength in numbers if they know each other they're less likely to fail they'll hold on to each other and my my, my rationale behind it was um, whenever they get on the stretch race for example on P Company if you know that bloke to your right you're more inclined to stay on because are you really going to give him 100% of your weight are you going to come off because he's that, that stretcher still has to go are you going to give that man all your weight now if you don't know him you won't care. But if you do, you're going to stay on it. So I thought, I'll get them all together and start eating together. Build the psychosocial element of training. Um, so what we do is have a, we go and have a meal. And during that meal, I'd bring in uh, paratroopers to come and speak to them and talk to them about... I'd bring in instructors from depots as a familiar face when they got there. And it was, you know, we built this, built this program. And what I found is that the program wasn't designed to make them paratroopers. It was designed to make them survive. Because I remember all those years ago, it's about survival. The fittest people failed when I went through training. They all failed because they just couldn't. They couldn't survive. They, they was too almost too fit. They peaked that week in the first couple of weeks, and I was thinking, my God, they're miles ahead of me. And then all of a sudden, they're on their way down. You, you understand periodization. They're on their way down. They've, 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 they're knackered. They've got nothing else to give. Where I'm like that, I had nothing to start with. So I'm just going up and up and up. And I peaked at the right times. And so my idea was it. Right, I'm not building paratroopers. I'm going to build a soldier with a solid foundation of strength and give the instructors at Powerheads Depot a platform to build them. That's it. So when, that's all I want you to do. I want you to create your way. You can, they can throw whatever the fuck they want at them. They can do whatever training they want at them. They will not break. We will not get an MSKI. So MSKIs went down to zero, where predominantly that was the biggest reason why people was failing. None. And all I did was build these young lads to be so strong and stable that whatever they got thrown at them, it was easy. The fitness would get taken care of because they would have a foundation to build upon. Parareds Depot would do that because I'd been part of that program two years earlier. And and it worked. So we got we then that when those lads then got to P Company, they are they had an eighty eight point five percent pass pass rate across all these co ops. So I did loads and loads of up Achilles. 88.5% so I was like right 16 year old kids have now got a 9 out of 10 chance of passing the physical standards of Parachute Regiment Depot that hadn't been done before it was like and so it started off with 20 people my final cohort of Op Achilles had 88 people so now not only are we putting more people on seats and not only are they now passing we're getting a higher percent of passing these kids are available the, the best ability we own is being available at all times for the next 20 years you're not getting some 34-year-old bloke who's just crawled over the line at Paradise Depot because his knees are given out, but he's passed. You're getting 16-year-olds who are ready and available for years and years for you to mould into whatever the fuck you want. And you can throw whatever you want at them, put any sort of load on them. They will not break. And that's how Op Achilles was found. So that's the, And I built that in a sense of, we're, we're not going to overtrain. So going back to the, a long-winded, going back to the original question, we need to basically just build a foundation, give the instructors a platform to build upon we can train hard later down the line. We can optimize human performance later down the line. Right now, let's ensure that at all costs, we can stay the course. Whenever I do any sort of training programs, first for any sort of course, any sort of project, is first and foremost, we must stay the course. Because if we stay on the course, we have 100% more chance of passing. Because if you break, no one cares how fit you are. It's irrelevant. If you, if you, if you fall short on P company because your knees gave out, no one gives a fuck how fast you can run. No one cares. No one's going to remember you. No one's going to go, yeah, but he would have passed P Company if his knees didn't go. It's irrelevant. No one cares. So first and foremost, we stay the course. We stay injury-free by ensuring that we never, ever get an MSKI. And that's what I did with Op Achilles. 
and it worked they built the paratroopers I just gave them a foundation remarkably effective and actually when you distill it down into the elements that that were missing beforehand it's actually just applying as you said athletic logic how do we get the best out of athletes in a professional sporting world how do we apply that to the, the tactical athletes because that's exactly what they are at this critical point in time where we can mold them into whatever we want them to be mm-hmm. I, th- I think the biggest i mean we, we, we've got we've got sf all over the all over the world and we've got we've got people applying for the marines we've got every age group of people in there people people um that have passed out hills and whole variety and generally speaking when people come to us zone two is what's missing the the demand for i'm gonna every run i do i'm gonna do it full send with a weight vest on why are my hips so ruined why do i feel so battered every every long rock at the weekend is going to be at at sort of race weight shall we yeah. say where you're, you're using what you're going to be using on the hills and as you said you're broken before you get there so you want to get to the you want to get to the standard where you can tolerate what the course is going to throw at you this is from my perspective as a civvy might i add i don't want to get waltzy at all but um as a civvy the perception we've got is that it's the ego and the intensity and i think you've always got to be working harder than the guy next to you that is ultimately the biggest limiting factor so if you can remove the ego from that and allow them to understand the trajectory upwards as you said it means that the crash downwards isn't going to be as aggressive because as you said putting people around for dinner putting people around doing things together supporting the guy next to you that is going to wear down that masculine ego that you'll get a lot of in that space and i think this is what applies in a civilian environment as well because you put that into a business setting you put that into a friendship setting and it means you're just more intuitive with those around you you actually know how yeah. to get the best out of the person next to you you know how to get the best out yourself. You know when you're working too hard. You know when you're burning the candle at both ends. And you don't let that arbitrary, I've got to be doing the most, I've got to be working the hardest. You've got to be working the smartest and you've got to yeah. be reflecting on what you're doing. And that's how you get the best out of yourself long term. And then, as you said, once you've got those foundations nailed, that's where you really start to look at, right, how can I nail this next 1%, that next 2%, that next 3%. And I think there's a bit of a culture in the fitness yeah. industry and, and people that have got a growth mindset as a whole worldwide at the moment where everybody's looking for a for a one percenter before they've got the foundations nailed which yeah. sleep supplements should i be taking when i only sleep four hours a night well you should be sleeping you should be sleeping more first and foremost my friend it's, it's little things like this that you see a lot of yeah. so it's um or, or the or the the incessant desire to optimize quote unquote recovery when you're doing double sessions a day seven days a week because you yeah. like training hard you can't recover from being tanked all the time by getting in an ice bath you need to program more effectively but this is probably a rabbit hole that we're not going to go down otherwise we'll uh, we'll end up we'll end up fairly deep into yeah. it i'd imagine so i think well, it, it's fascinating to just hear that actually you brought together all of the human elements of training and that is what ultimately brought the best out of these individuals that is trying to get that over the line though when people were seeing what i was doing at the start um the people the hierarchy the you know it was people was like what are you doing why are you doing that um and it was only because Power Edge was really supportive of me. And I just, I just created this uh, another program uh, uh, six months before. It's one of the reasons why I got this job. Talking about AFC at this time, where I got a hundred percent pass rate of every person on camp of physical tests, physical standards, no more injuries, and everyone was upskilled and, and what's known as MFD, so they medically fit to deploy. And I did that through individualising training. So I had a, so people was already you know just give them a chance, and I was really fortunate. I, I fought my way through. And but trying to get that over the line with the dinosaurs was just outrageous when they realised that, you know, why aren't we running? They need to be tabbing more. Uh, so up Achilles is still going and they've just sent their lads up there and they've just, they were talking about they've just now just finished their, what another test that they do up there is a two miler, sub 18 minutes carrying um, around about 20 kg. And every single person come in under 16 minutes, 16 year olds. And they don't, and they was like, "Oh, it's amazing! You know, it's, you know, it's really good. We're getting a really quality standard." And it was like they've done one loaded march on Up Achilles, one. And it's like this is so me trying to get that signed off two years earlier when I'm telling them, "No, we ain't going doing loaded marches every day," because that's what they was going. No, the reason they're failing is because they need more. They need to, they need to get un- under load under the Bergen needs to be doing more tabbing. I was like, "Okay, leave it with me." And, I'm, and then they come into the gym and I'm doing like the bird dog with them and they're like, what's going on in here? What's happening? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this week we're doing velocity-based training. They're like, nah, never heard of it. I'm not doing that. Don't like it. And I'm just like, just just give me a chance. <laughs> fortunately, I fortunately did. And then obviously, um, when pass rates rocketed, 
people start believing that. But not only was the hierarchy believing, I couldn't get that the junior soldiers were. This was catching on. And I said, right, we are, I got them in this room and I was like, we are different. If you want to be a paratrooper, you have to be different. You want, you want to, you, your why has to be so strong. If you don't want to be here, go now. Save everyone time. Walk out the door now. Go and join a different unit. It's no, it's no hardship. There's no hard feelings. No one's going to take the piss out of you. And then this is where the secret athlete concept came to. I said, right, we are different. And I want you to believe that. You are better than everyone. And if you believe that, it's great. However, you are not a paratrooper yet. So you do not walk around this camp and you do not belittle anyone. And now I'd have this bigger horizon of the military and I'd a better understanding that you know, other units are really good as well. And there's, I've got really close mates in, in loads of other units. And I was like, you do not belittle anyone. You train in silence and you win in silence. You are not a paratrooper yet. So you walk around here and you help everyone and you're there and you, you still win. Find a way to win. Be the best at everything. But I want you to do it in silence. I want you to be humble about everything. And that's where the secret athlete concept started coming from. I was like, what we do in this room doesn't leave this room. What we do in training doesn't leave the training. If you, people's back squats were like going through the, because you obviously you start doing specific training with people with a low training age. We both know numbers go through the roof. And I was like, don't tell anyone. Great. You know, shake it, shake, shake your partner's hand and that's it. It's done. Well done. You just doubled your back squat, but we don't talk about it again. We just utilize that as a model to train from. Um, and that's where the secret athlete concept started coming from. And that became really, really powerful. You could see chests getting bigger. You could see people growing, you know, and, and at the end, what they do is they get, they get, uh, fitted out with their kit before they then go into phase two so what I was trying to do is basically bring everything over so the transition was really simple it wasn't just a physical pathway I was trying to do loads of stuff so their coat their instructors would come over and they'd fit them and the lads were in the gym with their tops off getting fitted with all their, their new vertex and it was just like and I could see the instru- these people were jacked these 16 year olds were jacked and I was like we've done well here and and yeah, and he was just ready for it, and he was ready for absolutely anything, which is the parachute regiment motto. And he was good to go. And we just we created these monsters, these secret athletes that were just ready to whatever you thrown at them, they was good to go. Again, that's just detaching the ego from it, isn't it? Because mm. at the end of the day, if you're training to be a paratrooper, it it doesn't fucking matter what you back squat. Mm-hmm. Yes, the bigger the back squat might make you in some ways more competent physically to help you become a paratrooper but if no one go- else gives a shit exactly if the goal is to become a paratrooper then the back squat how big your chest is how jacked you look in the mirror all these things are rings in a ladder on the way up mm-hmm. to the ultimate goal and if you start to celebrate all those small wins too much and let your ego get the better of you then you're yeah. losing sight of the bigger goal and ultimately you're doing yourself a disservice and i think that again applies in applies in all walks of life if you're process driven like i am like i know you will be then you enjoy the process because it's getting you towards the end goal and you enjoy the process in and of itself. But you celebrate the wins quietly because you know they're getting you closer to where you want to get to. But you don't let that emotional spike that we've spoken about already get the better of you either because that'll that'll catch up with you. If you think that this is what it's going to be like, that small win's going to carry you forwards and you've done the job, then you're not going to get the job done. I think that applies in, in every setting. And with that in mind, now as a civvy, working with civvies, working with everybody, working in different settings all over the world. What are the biggest lessons that you've taken from your career in the military that you now apply to your day-to-day life? And are there any that you think that anyone and everyone can take away to better themselves on a day-to-day basis? Um, probably summing up what I've just said, the, the, the two rationales of the secret athlete and the tactical athlete. The tactical athlete is, is the mindset of being ready for anything. So especially in, even from a sporting context, from a business, you are ready for absolutely anything. You know, what if, um, you know, in my day in life now, if my little girl wants to go and do ballet, you better fucking believe that I will be ready to be the best dad doing ballet. If she wants to play football, then you better believe I'll be doing doggies up and down. I'll be ready for that. My body will be capable to go and withstand that. If my mate gives me a call now and we go out for a run, I'm good to go. I trained just before we got on this call. Um, I'm good to go. Whatever it is, I'm ready. And... I try to put that into my athlete's perspective of that, especially in the tactical world, when you're training people to go on selection, and especially when I'm training paratroopers to go on that next step to go on. They want to go on. Uh, let's say they're going on January selection. I know, and we've gone through barriers, so we know. I know that shit's going to come up because they're in the paras, and they're going to be going away for three weeks out of nowhere. And I know we've got to be ready for that, and we've got to have to be able to account for that for part of our training. So we're missing three weeks worth of training now. 
in the build-up. It's quite, it's quite a significant amount. So I know we've got to account for that. It's being ready to, to, to mould and be very dynamic. And that comes back to the individualization as well. So understanding the athlete and understanding the pathway is really key. It's, it's why I can't scale. It's a really shit business model in the fact that um, I can only take so many people on because I get to know them into the deepest level you can possibly think of so that I can program them effectively. Because if I don't know them, then I don't know the best plan for them. So the tactical athlete, I take that into every concept of being ready for absolutely anything. Whatever gets thrown at us, we're going to be ready for it. When things go wrong on the hills, you're going to be ready for it. When you have a bad day on P Company or the commando, you're going to be ready. You just keep going. Don't worry about it. You keep going. We'll be ready for those moments. And the next one is the secret athlete. Is everyone who I coach, you'll always you'll see that nothing ever comes out on social media, ever. I never talk about any athletes, especially because of the people that we work with. I'll never ever put a look where this person was and look where they are now, like a transformational fucking Tuesday, whatever it is. I'll never do that. And I appreciate that. And I actually quite like looking at them on Instagram. I actually quite like it. Uh, but I don't do it because I've got the secret athlete concept. And I think it's really powerful that when they sign up to the program, one of the first things we have the conversation is, this is all confidential. We train in silence and we win in silence. And I think that's a really powerful psychological tool that we can take away that they have no idea how prepared we are. When you're on that, when you're on that start line, I want you to look around. I want you to feel powerful that no one has any idea how prepared you are for this moment. No one. And you're just, they'll know who you are when you win. And I have that and I've tried and breathe that into everyone. Don't let's just keep training in silence. We'll make the noise when we win. Let everyone else but those who are talking too much, those who are uploading every second, you know, that they're showing you the best parts. They're showing every all these social media influencers who, who you know, do, do, doing whatever they do on Instagram with the tops off. That's their best moment. That's their, their physically, that's their best moment. They're not showing you everything else underneath. Don't worry about that. They'll know who we are when we win. And I try and I try and ingrain that into every athlete I've got. So the secret athlete and the tactical athlete are my biggest takeaways I can possibly give any athlete, any coach to, to run with. So the bottom line is for, for anyone and everyone, it's a case of develop your skills across the board in whatever walk of life you're in so that you can be prepared for whenever things go wrong without it yeah. rocking the boat too much. Yeah. And then secondly is celebrating celebrating everything every day means that your actual notion of celebration and success will be diluted and that diluted, when you do yeah. get to the start line and when you get to a job promotion or when you get to this, that or the other or a difficult conversation with your boss, whatever it is, you'll be in a better headspace to be able to tackle that head on because it will yeah. actually give the moment the attention, focus it deserves rather than this diluted, let's only focus on the good things because then when the yeah. bad things come along, and they will, then you are just as happy tackling those acknowledging those and wearing those in your sleeve as you are the good bits and mm -hmm. i think uh yeah there's a lot of that that i i know that i implement in my day-to-day -day life which i would i would echo is very very valuable from my perspective so mike thank you very very much very enjoyed that very enjoyed that very much enjoyed that and it's been a pleasure where, mate where can people find you so you can get me um at every social media platform um at coach mike chadwick um, and I genuinely mean this when I say this if you if you ever want to reach out and ask any sort of questions you've got anything you want to know um, just reach out and ask me a question I will try my hardest to get back to, to with the best possible answer I can give and if I don't know the answer I'm, I'm big enough and ugly enough to pass you on to someone who does and I'll definitely know someone who will know the answer um, so you, you can get me at Coach Mike Chadwick Fantastic well thank you again mate really enjoyed that and uh, speak soon Thank you mate